First Sergeant Cap here with Company D, 2nd United States Sharpshooters, and thanks for joining us for another Reenacting 101 video. Today's topic is going to be an introduction to sewing for reenactors. Now, soldiers going into the war, very few of them knew how to sew, but they quickly had to learn for the practical purpose of being able to keep their pants up and the financial responsibility that um, if they wore out their uniform, before the next reissue, they would be financially liable for an early uh, reissue. So it was very practical for soldiers to take good care of their uniforms while in the field. Now, um, how you build your sewing kit is going to be unique to your own type of uniform, your impression, and what your personal needs are. So I'm gonna show you what I run and you can maybe um, draw some conclusions and maybe get some ideas on how to build your own. Now, much like many of the soldiers during the Civil War, I highly recommend uh, every reenactor have some sort of housewife, which is a soldier sewing kit. A lot of these would have been made um, back at home and sent to the front. Um, different um, charitable organizations would also make these and issue them to the troops. They are incredibly handy and organize all your sewing stuff. Don't have a housewife, you say? Well, you can go to our website at secondusss.com and go to the uh, search bar, type in housewife, and you'll find our free pattern on how to make your own. It'd be a great way to um, start working on your sewing skills because this is a really good beginner project. Um, you'll see mine is fully loaded as first sergeant. Um, I may have to not only mend my gear, uh, but also help new recruits uh, in our unit um, patch and fix their stuff too. So I need to have a, a wide assortment as a first sergeant to always be prepared. First thing you'll see is I have an assortment of buttons and this whole bottom pocket is even more buttons. Um, civilian, military, um, buttons for, for tents. It's, it's really good to have an assortment. But if you're packing light and you're brand new, um, just try to have a few replacement buttons for whatever uniform gear that you're carrying. Most sutlers will have a selection, so you could go and buy a spare one of each size that you might need and keep it in your housewife. The other thing that I have sticking out, uh, I have uh, wool patches that match the uniforms that I typically wear. So I have some green for my Bernan trousers and I have some uh, blue wool for like sack coats and uh, stuff like that. Then I have a wide assortment of different types of needles and pins. Um, when it comes to needles, uh, to keep it super simple, um, get two small ones, two medium ones, and one or two large ones. Um, for you know a fine needles for normal sort of craft store thread for like sewing on a shirt button would be really handy um, a couple uh, medium needles like uh, embroidery needles for example would be a good choice something with a, a bigger eye for a, a medium size thread and uh, maybe a glover's needle or uh, a small saline needle for uh, patching uh, maybe your dog tent or your tent fly or something like that and then I have an assortment of pins to, to hold uh, the pieces of fabric together as I'm working on it so they don't move. And I even have one of these curved uh, upholstery needles, which are handy for when you're sewing on rank or, or hat badges. Um, I don't use these very often, but when you need them, they're really handy. You appreciate them. And then I have my pack of saline needles in the top. I have a small pair of scissors and an assortment of different sizes, colors, and materials of thread. I just have these on these little uh, cardboard um, embroidery spools. You can get any craft store, they're really cheap. But if you want really authentic looking ones, you can pick them up at the Sutler of Fort Scott. So what type of thread do I use and what I recommend? Well, you should, ideally have colors of thread that match whatever uniforms or equipment that you have. Um, and then all your thread needs to be of natural material. So no polyesters, no rayons, nothing modern made. So you're primarily going to be looking at linen and cotton. Um, there are others that are period correct, but you're not as likely to use them. 
Um, one of those that are probably less likely is hemp. And I have some hemp, hemp thread that I picked up from Townsend's, as long as they're really nice um, linen thread. And they come on these um, nice spools, and then I put them on my small uh, little cards. Then, so yeah, I mean, you can see like the, the hemp is like a medium to heavyweight thread. And then the linen is thicker than what I think we're used to today, um, but still very nice. And then I have like a, a medium weight all, uh, pre-waxed linen thread. Um, this is kind of my secret weapon. Um, it's super heavy duty and I use more wax linen thread on repairs regardless of what I'm working on than anything else because this stuff is indestructible. And that comes to the other part. It's like, well, what's wax linen thread and why is it so strong? Well, wax linen thread, I mean, it comes in different weights. So I have like a medium weight. So it's already pretty heavy duty, which is why I recommend having like a medium to um, large size needle to accommodate the thickness in the eye. Um, but you should have a little block of wax in your sewing kit to wax all your thread with. Um, wax helps um, the durability of the thread. It helps it sew easier and it kind of relaxes the fibers so it doesn't get tangled on you as much. Um, and this is kind of standard practice in all historical sewing practices. And you know, you can pick up these little cubes um, or you can get bigger blocks at stores. Or if you're running a candle lantern um, and you have beeswax candles, you already have beeswax. Um, you can see on this candle, the wear marks right here of where I've actually taken out my candle and used it to wax my thread in the field. So if you, if you run beeswax candles, you're already set. So um, one last thing about needles I want to say is some of the fine needles that I carry um, are actually original Civil War needles. And you see me use a lot of original stuff, or at least more original stuff on the channel. Um, and that's because, I mean, some of it is, of course, really, really expensive. Um, but some of it is also very affordable. Um, this pack of 150-year-old needles in the original wrapper was $13 on eBay. Um, I had to remove some of the rust, but other than that, they're completely serviceable. And my wife has been using these as she uh, hand sews my cot quilt this winter. Um, so if you want to go original, it's, it's accessible. So uh, let's go ahead and get started in some of the basic stitches that will get you covered for most of your sewing needs. For our first stitch today, we are going to do a running stitch. For demonstration, so you can see it easier on camera, I have a heavy duty black wax linen thread and a saline needle for demonstration. Uh, I also have a scrap piece of cotton in an embroidery hoop to help you see a little bit better. Um, now the first part when you begin sewing is you need to choose the right needle for the job and thread your needle. Now if you're using a single strand of thread, you just leave a tail on one end and you go to the other end and tie a knot. Um, if you need say you only have some fine thread and you want it a little heavy, more heavy duty, then you would just double your thread over and run it so it's an equal length, um, equal halves, and then tie both loose ends together and you'll have double strength thread. So the running stitch is sort of the beginning of all sewing. It is not the strongest of stitches, um, but we'll serve a lot of good purpose and is sort of the foundation for the rest of our stitches. Um, <clears throat> now, when it comes to sewing, you're going to hear terms like right side and wrong side of the material. Whether you're following a pattern or you're watching somebody on YouTube, um, right side essentially refers to the part that you're going to see when wearing the garment. So you typically don't want to start any knots um, on the right side of the garment. You want to start on the wrong side or the hidden part of the garment. So for the sake of demonstration, this part here is going to be the right side of our garment. 
And then the bottom here is going to be the wrong side. There's a, there's a lot more about the wrong side and right side of fabric, but for the sake of learning the stitch, this is gonna work for us. So we are going to start on the bottom, on the wrong side of the garment. And we have our knot on the end of our thread, just like that. And then we are going to pull our string through. Now, as you get better, your stitches will be more even and more consistent and follow more of a straight line. So then you need to determine how long you want your stitch length to be. Now, if you get into uh, historical research, they're, they're, they're gonna be very particular. Um, generally speaking, the tighter your stitch count, the stronger the seam is going to be. Um, there are exceptions, like when you work in heavy materials, you'd want a wider stitch count. But for in general, when you're working on fabrics, the, the tighter the stitch count, the better. And it's also the, the, the badge of a good sewer. So then you just go up from the bottom, down to the top, and then you go over again, up from the bottom, down from the top and you pull your slack all the way through each time. Try to keep everything even. Hoping this comes out all right. I'm doing this through the camera monitor. <laughs> and you just keep doing that until your garment is stitched. So up from the bottom, down from the top. Now, the other thing you can do for the running stitch is you can take multiple stitches in one pass. So what I'll do is I'll come up and instead of going straight down all the way, I will factor in my stitch length, my space, my stitch length, come up and you can take you can make multiple stitches with one pull just like that so you that way if you have limited space this this can also be a very handy way of stitching Just like that. So now, say you're done, let's go ahead and finish on the wrong side of the piece. Then all you have to do is make a loop. So you just kind of go through your material, try to keep it as invisible as possible, and you just make a little knot. And if you need it to be super strong, you can do it again. Go through the material. Make your loop. Go through and pull. So that is the running stitch. Now we can trim that off. And now we can show you the stronger stitch and the one that I recommend for most common use. And it's called the back stitch. So, once again, we'll start from the wrong side. We'll come over here, come up from the bottom, and then we'll go down. Okay, well, now we got our start. Now you're going to come up about where you want your stitch length to be, so just however it's going to look equal, and you're going to come up. Now, instead of going forward, like in the running stitch, you're going to go back to the other hole, just like that. This is also a really good um, beginning embroidery stitch, and it's how um, we uh, label most of our canteens that you can see in our how to defarb your canteen video. So again, come up from the bottom, 
and go back to where you came from. There you go. Okay, factor in your stitch length by going ahead from the wrong side, come up, and then go back, just like that. And just like that. And then again, once you're done, Tighten everything up, make a knot, and cut it off. Just like that. So now the next handy thing for you to learn isn't exactly a stitch. It's a, a useful skill, and one you're probably going to do many times over the course of your reenacting career. So, and that is going to be sewing on a button. Now, if you're brand new to the hobby and you just bought a uniform straight out of the Sutler and you're going to your first event, um, take the time and re-sew all of your buttons. Most of the uniforms that you get, especially the import ones, the buttons are just sewn on just to sell them. They're sometimes just barely hanging on and it's one of the most common things um, new reenactors coming into our company looking for sewing help. Um, that's the number one problem they have. So with a button all you need to do, let me make sure that this button is big enough for this giant needle. Okay, we're good. So you have your button. This is a, a bone one. And so you just follow the pattern, the stitching pattern. So if you had a four hole button, let's see if I have one. So here's a four hole uh, tin button. Uh, you would just copy whatever pattern um, has been done on the previous buttons on your garment. So normally for these, it's sort of a crisscross pattern, but sometimes they go back and forth. It, it just depends. Just copy it the way that the other one was done. So we have a nice little two hole and you hold it onto your garment. Once again, come up from the wrong side, dig around for the hole of the button, come up, it's a little, little goofy with oversized implements, pull it through, and go back down the bottom. Now you want to try to make it nice, but when you start out, don't, don't stress it. Um, as you get better, the back side will look really nice, but when you're reenacting, you just want to make sure that your your braces are going to stay on. And then you go back through, and you fish around, try to find the hole again, and then you pull it through, and you go back over. Now, since buttons are one of the most commonly replaced things in the hobby, is one of the biggest reasons I use wax linen thread because it's super heavy duty. I have actually broken the button itself, but not the thread. The stuff is so strong. And because it's so heavy duty, you don't have to run as many stitches as if you were using a, a fine thread, for example. So that's one of the added benefits. But generally, you know, you're looking, you know, two or three times if you're using a heavy thread and however many you think you need for fine thread. Let's see if I can get this through one more time. There we go, we got a button, and you flip it over, so we got lucky, and it looks nice. So again, you can just, Ooh, that's not gonna let me do that with a sailing needle. So again, you just tie off, and there's all sorts of different types of knots, different ways to sew on buttons. But if you know how to do like the most basic stitches, you'll be able to make it through your event just fine. And then always try to make two knots for your buttons since they'll get a lot of strain. And we got two knots. And so we have our running stitch, our back stitch, and a button. Now it's time 
for one of the most commonly talked about sewing practices in the hobby, and that is sewing a buttonhole. Now, sewing a buttonhole isn't something you're likely going to need to do right away, um, but it is really common in the hobby. It's a great way to improve an impression easily, and all the cool kids talk about the importance of hand-sewn buttonholes. So it wouldn't hurt to learn how to do it, um, even if you don't use it that much. Um, I make a ton of them when I make the uh, dog tents for our company. So the first thing you gotta do is figure out how big your buttonhole needs to be based on the size of button you're going to use and um, and what sort of string you need for the project. So for this, I'm just using a, a single strand of thread with a knot on one end. And I already came up through the hole and up through the top. And now we're gonna go over, try to keep our stitching evenly spaced. Now I'm not gonna pull the needle all the way through right now, so I'm just gonna leave it right there. And we have this string that we started with, and we're going to go under our needle. And then we're going to go over the top, like that. Now we're going to pull our thread through. And then you just repeat a ton of times until you go all the way around your buttonhole. So come through, take that string underneath, over and around like that, and then pull. Through the hole, up to the top, take that bottom string underneath, over the top and pull. And how tight you make these stitches is going to be dependent on the garment or item you are working on. And there you go, string underneath the bottom, up and over the top, just like that. And then you just keep going all the way around and then you knot off on the wrong side of the material. But you can see how you have the string kind of protecting the edge as you go along. And that is how you make a buttonhole. Now I have to admit for our last stitch, this is more of an advanced stitch, but one you're, you may need to know how to do in order to repair a garment. Or you might be curious about getting into some of the uh, garment kits that are available in the hobby out there. And this one will be used quite often. So I have a seam right here that I stitched two pieces of fabric together, just like that. And we need to finish this hem. See? See if you pull on it, it starts to fray. That's, that's not good. It's not going to look nice. It's not going to give us a nice finished professional appearance. So what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to flat fell this seam, this hem, and um, we are going to use a felling stitch. It has some other different names. It's essentially a whip stitch used on a hem. So we have these two equal pieces, and what we're going to do on one of them is cut one really, really short. So I got my full size scissors here. And we're just going to trim it down. You use this um, on uh, putting the panels together on a shelter half. So you see you have a short one and a long one. Now, this is pretty simple. Um, I, I say that as I try to do this through a camera. So hopefully this, this works right. So what you do is you fold your hem over. This is so much easier to do when you can just do it in your lap. You fold it over and then bloop, just like that. Try to make it, make it look nice. Now this isn't so much a, a this isn't a structural stitch, although it, it does add some strength. Um, this is just trying to hold it down so you get a nice finished hem. Nice. So. Again, uh, I'm just using a single strand of thread with a knot on one end. 
and we're going to get started. And on this bottom piece, you're going to take just little itty bitty nibbles, the smallest nibbles that you can, um, because this stitch will be seen on the right side of the piece. Um, that's why when you do this, you want to make sure that your thread matches as close as possible uh, to the fabric that you're sewing. So now I'm started. So here's our bottom piece. Here's our, our top piece. And I'm going to try to make big stitches so they show up better on the camera. So I'm just taking like the teeniest of little bites. And I want to hit this corner just like that. If you hear weird noises in the background that's that's my dog he's making himself comfortable so little bite on the bottom piece and then hit that corner just like that and then pull through and how how tight these stitches are is largely going to be based on if you're repairing it you're going to want to try to match the stitches per inch and that's what you're trying to repair or it's it's personal preference um victorians were very obsessed with really tight stitch counts um so whatever's going to get the job done for you you just need to make sure that this stays nice and flat and cotton's really handy um because you can crease it with your finger and hold it in place and again, little bite on the bottom, just like that, hit the corner, and you go until you are done with your your seam, get that little up there nice and close, just like that, and then we'll, we can flip it over, and hopefully you can see it, but see, with this, with this style, you will have a little bit of poke through, and if you match your thread, um, you'll almost never notice it. Um, but this is a, a common uh, hem finishing technique. And then when you're done, all you gotta do is just tie off like you normally do. And you have a nice professionally finished seam. Thanks for sticking around on this introduction to sewing video. We hope it's been helpful and will get you started in, in mending and repairing your own clothes and building your own sewing kit for reenacting. Um, feel free to share this video if you liked it or you think someone else can benefit from it. Um, thanks as always for liking and subscribing. And one last thing I want to talk about before we leave. I do not know the historical accuracy of these, but this could be really helpful for some of you that may have eye troubles or um, dexterity issues, maybe arthritis, and threading a needle can be really difficult for you. Um, you may want to tuck away one of these. I'm just going to focus. But it's a little piece of, I don't know, steel, aluminum, something like that. Um, and it has a little threader right here. And this will go through the eye of a needle. And you stick your thread through it and you pull it back. It's a needle threader. Um, these are really cheap ones. You can buy them at any craft store. Um, and they also have more ergonomic ones which are definitely not period correct, but could be very handy and completely acceptable if you know you keep it tucked away in your housewife. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you all knew about this handy little gizmo. So once again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.